Now, our first presenters for today are co-founder and managing director, John Kelly, and chief financial officer, Will Suter of Otomo Diagnostics. Otomo was commercializing a range of next generation, user-friendly rapid di diagnostic test devices that deliver improved health outcomes. And today with the onset of COVID-19 and the challenges for many seeking face-to-face -face medical consults, the growing acceptance and uptake of telehealth is providing significant global opportunities for Otomo's diagnostic devices. There's a great deal of interest around the Otomo story at the moment, so we're very pleased to have the team here today. Um, I'd like to now request that we start screen sharing uh, and we'll hand over to John who will get us started. Thanks, John. Yes, thanks, Jane. Thanks for having us on the uh, on the presentation. I wanted to talk today a little bit about the company, but really more about what we're seeing in terms of a, a very rapidly changing landscape in relation to how healthcare gets delivered, uh, and obviously then how diagnostics can 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 be part of that. With specific uh, commentary around what we're seeing from our US uh, customers. By way of background, for anyone not familiar with the company. Uh, we're an Australian headquartered rapid diagnostics business listed on the ASX in April of last year. And we really came to market to raise capital to expand the commercial opportunities uh, around our very innovative and, and unique integrated rapid testing solutions. Up until about two months ago, virtually all of our revenue was generated from offshore export contracts, primarily North America and Europe. But we have obviously in the last few months seen a very substantive increase in business locally here through our antigen and antibody rapid tests for COVID. Uh, our technology up until its uh, adoption here was being uh, increasingly recognized in key international markets. And we'll talk a little bit about those markets and we'll talk about how those markets are really starting to change now post pandemic in terms of how our customers engage with healthcare and how that, that, that healthcare is reimbursed. Just to summarize kind of where, where, we, where we were this year, we completed registration of our antibody and antigen tests. And as mentioned, up until 30 June, we really didn't see a lot of business locally in Australia, 50,000 tests in the second half of FY21. Nearly all of that was antibody testing for serology. Uh, we only sold a couple of thousand devices for antigen testing to some Australian Olympic teams pre uh, the Olympics. But obviously since July 1 and the onset of Delta, that's changed materially and we're now seeing some very significant opportunities here in large part driven by changes not only to public policy around testing but also changes to how telehealth can be part of the health uh, ecosystem. We also secured our first FDA approval at the very end of FY21 and that's not only supported the uh, antibody test <clears throat> partnership we have in North America with Access Bio but more importantly it's opened up uh, a whole range of inbound inquiries from North American potential partners. And a lot of those opportunities are around delivering tests into the home uh, with home telehealth now being the, the main channel that's being considered uh, in the past. It used to be doctor office and, and, and retail pharmacy, but now direct to the consumer via home health and telehealth is really uh, driving a lot of the opportunity that we're seeing from customers in America. We continue to support our HIV business in global health. And we supply our HIV self-test directly to the Australian market as an e-commerce product. So that's already been sold through e-health channels. And we, we see that expanding now in Australia as well as overseas markets. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing in our OEM business and how it pertains to not only our US market entry, but also our uh, acceptance and adoption of telehealth as a major driver of uh, opportunity over the coming years. Our HIV business, it was was sort of surpassed in terms of revenue by our COVID business. We have a deal in North America that's now underway post the approval of our product by FDA. Uh, that's a professional use product, but again, point of care approved, which means it can be used in doctor offices and in pharmacies. And here in Australia, we are uh, moving forward with engagement with TGA to talk to uh, the regulator about the pathway to self-test approval for our professionally approved product. Uh, we're one of a number of manufacturers doing that, but already with TGA, we have seen some changing guidance that moved from having a healthcare worker on site to having a system that was supported by telehealth so that a healthcare worker could be on call as needed to support 
testing at, at factories and, and offices and in workplaces, but without having to have a healthcare worker on site. And that adoption of telehealth and that reimbursement of telehealth has really opened up that channel and allows you to interface much more directly with, with the end user of your product through a telehealth connected uh, facility. And we think that although that's really come to market for COVID, uh, that is a channel that's here to stay. We believe it's growing very rapidly in the US. We expect to see growth in Australia. And ultimately, I think there'll be a whole range of healthcare services and diagnostic services that start to get delivered directly into uh, people's homes and workplaces and less of a need to go to a clinic or, or, or hospital facility. And I think triage will start to happen in the home with a trip to the doctor being a follow-on activity rather than necessarily the primary uh, engagement with the healthcare system. Our HIV business has, has grown strongly uh, in the last quarter since we got the Unity of Tender by way of our partnership with Milan Viatris. Uh, that's still currently being delivered primarily through face-to-face -face training. Uh, there is in South Africa a model where it's been delivered over the internet through a training module and people test at home. Even though they buy the product in the pharmacy, they test at home through a, a home health system that our partner in South Africa has developed. We see that as being scalable. Uh, we're very interested in the US market. We've launched our product in global health markets, Europe, Australia. The two big markets we haven't yet reached commercial agreements for are China and the US. Both of them have enormous potential, uh, not just for HIV, but for, for testing at home more broadly. And we're looking to execute in this FY some expansion partnerships that would see our HIV test uh, go into the US market and, and also into the, the Chinese market. And again, that would be targeting uh, key groups such as PrEP users and high risk cohorts through a direct to consumer engagement policy. Uh, HIV is not the kind of product that necessarily sells to the general public over the counter. It's, it's more of a, a targeted message. Uh, and we think it's ideally suited to telehealth and home health. Uh, our OEM business, interestingly, has picked up uh, post-pandemic with a lot of interest coming in from the US. What's really changed, I think, is the type of interest that we're getting now. Pre-pandemic, it was smaller, early adopters that wanted our technology to upgrade their, their, their diagnostic solution, have better marketability, better regulatory approval, enter self-test markets. But really, it was smaller companies looking to, to get an advantage in their, in their commercialization activities. What we're seeing now is more engagement from larger organizations that I think have realized through this pandemic that the US market has changed. Uh, we're starting to see a lot more inbound inquiries from companies looking to see how our technology might be applicable to their market entry into home testing because these companies are, are big diagnostics players, but typically have been servicing the lab and doctor office market with instrument based point of care testing. And what Atomo has done is, is deliver a sort of end user solution that doesn't require a, a lab machine. And that's obviously much more suitable and much more applicable to home use and, and consumer use. And that's a business segment that a lot of these larger companies don't really have. And I think there's a lot more interest in our technology as a result of that. And that's been driven primarily by this very significant growth in home testing and telehealth enabled uh, healthcare it's really opened up what was quite a small niche market now into a market that accounts for the majority of the growth in the in the US diagnostic space currently. And obviously the, the big companies and the investment follow, follow, follow the opportunity. And that's now in home testing where we're very well positioned. Uh, Will, do you want to talk briefly on results? Yeah, yeah just to, to recap on the results for the year, we did 6.7 million in, in revenue, which was 25% up on FY20. And that was notwithstanding a couple of those deliverables coming through later in the year, being the uh, FDA approval for the access bio antibody tests on the Atomo platform and the HIV uh, Unitaid tender being awarded late in the year, obviously a bit delayed by COVID. Um, but I think what the chart in the top right shows is that, you know, Atomo's really only just started down that journey of full commercialization of this technology the team was really focused on solving that problem of taking a you know a lab style test and making it more user friendly and and uh, and more I guess easy, easier for lay users and consumers to use at home and, and that was the R and D phase of the company and really only in in eighteen and nineteen as we started to commercialise our HIV test by way of I guess example and pilot um, did we then get these opportunities to open up broader markets which we've seen with with COVID with HIV and with um, 
with our other OEM business uh, where we supply to, to Lumos Diagnostics, uh, who, who are one of our major customers in OEM over the course of the year. Um, and so I guess a, a quick recap on the money we've spent during the year, that was really to, to do what we said we would do at the IPO. We, we raised $30 million in April last year. We paid back uh, some debt we had, cleaned up the balance sheet, and then we continued to invest in expanding our uh, manufacturing capacity to support our scale up and also to continue to evolve you know, those, those devices that, um, that integrate usability and functionality and, and, uh, and are really targeted at the consumer and at the, you know, at the untrained user. So we spent around three and a half million dollars in R&D um, supporting those innovations and uh, saw ourselves at the end of the financial year with $80 million of cash on hand and, and no debt and in great shape going into these new markets in the new year. So in terms of before Tomo came along, uh, you know, this was really the, the rapid test solution of choice for blood testing. It was really a lab test redeployed in the field as a, as a point of care test, really an accessories based kit, the kind of thing that a year 12 might do for a chemistry experiment and, and not at all suited to consumer or doctor office use. Error rates were very high, user preferences and acceptability was low. Regulators weren't happy with the complexity and error rates, but the science on there had had a lot of uh, billions of dollars spent developing assays that were state of the art, but then deployed, uh, we felt to the end user in a very agricultural uh, and ill considered format. And what Otomo decided to do and has done very successfully is to wrap a consumer friendly integrated solution around that test strip. So that the, the test doesn't change, but it now goes into a device that was designed specifically for someone to use that test without training, without a lot of expertise, reduce down the steps of use, automate the buffer and sample delivery components, and to do it in a way that really uh, made that workflow uh, bulletproof. And we've been very successful in doing that. We've got the world's only uh, integrated rapid blood test for lateral flow. We're now in the process of expanding our addressable market to move into other sample types, swab, testing, saliva-based testing, which again, very suitable for home testing because of its low levels of invasiveness. Uh, but again, I think there are markets where Tomo is really showing that it's developing and commercializing the best solutions in the world. And that's starting to obviously get the interest of some larger players now that those segments that we're in are becoming a lot more valuable to the market more broadly. We have uh, excellent regulatory credentials on the platform. HIV self-testing is the only class four application. We have that across multiple markets. That now allows us to not only sell HIV tests, but more importantly, it allows us to say to the, the market, look, if we can do this for HIV self-testing, then your allergy test or your test for vitamin deficiency is a much, much lower level of regulatory, re regulatory risk. And that really helps with our OEM engagement. Likewise, we're the first company to come and really pull together this concept of integrating a kit into a single device. And we've got some very high level patent families that protect not only the integration of the, the functionality into a single device, but some of the ways that that works, some of the manufacturing processes that sit behind the components. And that gives us a very, very strong position we feel in terms of having a defendable, unique solution on the market that will attract uh, a, lot, a lot of licensing and commercialization opportunities from partners. And this slide really talks so, to the, the opportunities we see it will in the in the US market now. Yeah, sorry, John. I was just I was just going to jump in and, and take this one. So look, I, I think the you know the, the theme of today is to talk about um, the changing needs of consumers and, and how the company plays into that. And I think we, we find ourselves right in the sweet spot there. And really what when we came to market in April last year, we were expecting that to be a sort of five-year journey as acceptance of, of the kind of tests and devices that Atomo produces. You know, took some time to penetrate. And if you look at some of the numbers, for example, um, you know, 0.2% of, of consults were done uh, via telehealth and remote health before the pandemic. Now they've settled down around 6%, but they were as high as 15, 16% during the height of the pandemic. And, and so the pandemic has accelerated acceptance of consumers taking control of their own healthcare, doing more at home, doing more themselves. And, um, and the statistics bear that out. And the reason that environment is now far more favourable is because um, consumer acceptance has gone up because it, it's had to, 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 to deal with, um, you know, the necessity of testing at home and the necessity of consults at home. Investment's gone up. There's a huge amount of venture funding. You know, venture funding into digital and e-health has doubled in the last year. 
Um, regulatory acceptance has gone up. There's now over 80 services that are being reimbursed in the US market in particular um, for, for telehealth consults. Uh, and consumers themselves are now much more accepting of it. You know, 60, 70% of consumers are now more comfortable doing consults and telehealth consults at home. So that whole landscape has changed and that's really been driven by necessity as a result of the pandemic. And the interesting thing for us is there's a number of different ways that that's of interest to it, Tom. I mean, at the one end, you've got uh, very much medical diagnosis through telehealth consults where we can provide tests related to, um, you know, serious conditions like HIV and COVID. And at the other end, you've got more consumer focused companies like uh, Roe and Everlywell and, and Amazon and so forth, providing more consumer focused tests that with less regulatory compliance, um, where again, usability is key, where, you know, the appearance, the look and feel of the product's important. And so Otomo's devices are well suited to everything on that spectrum in terms of, you know, this emerging trend of, of telehealth and telewellness and, 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 and really self-care and looking after people in their own home environment. So that's really changed. And we've seen that change driven, um, obviously, primarily in the North American market uh, to a lesser degree, but also in Europe. And then eventually, maybe that, that sort of change in thinking will come to, to the Australian market. And I think with you know, the emergence of Delta, that's really caused some rethinking in terms of what's the appropriate way of, of, uh, of, of I guess, providing diagnostic support to people, providing healthcare support to people. And, and we've seen that change in public health policy here just in the last month or two that said, actually, it is okay to use rapid testing rather than you know, relying only on PCR testing for COVID in particular. Um, and we're hoping that that will flow on to self-testing for COVID, as John described. And that, together with our already approved HIV self-test, really starts to open up the door locally in Australia, I think, for, um, for more regulatory support uh, on that front. The next step, obviously, would be for, for there to be government support by way of reimbursement for those, um, for those types of you know, telehealth consults and, and the diagnostics and, and prescriptions that go behind that as well. And that's you know, that's an evolving process, but we're hoping that's the next step here in the domestic market. I think in terms of sort of how we're trying to pivot into those opportunities, you know, we recognize that the Australian healthcare and regulatory market is the most conservative in the developed world and the least adoptive of new point of care technology. So, you know, Australia has never been our primary market, although we are looking to, you know, maximize the opportunity and support the pandemic here for COVID as well as rolling out HIV. But really for us, it's about pivoting into the US market. That's where the growth is. That's where the real acceptance and reimbursed uh, landscape is supportive for our, our, our products. And we have a lot of large US partners potentially interested. So I think securing that US partner and entering that US market by way of some sort of telehealth partnership is key. Continuing to bring new partners and new applications onto the platform uh, is, is a key goal for this coming year, as is completion completion of development work around swab and saliva platforms so we can expand our addressable market and offer some of the larger companies a, a full solution across all sample types rather than just saying, you know, we've got the best blood-based tests in the world. We want to be able to, to say that we've got the best rapid tests in the world across all, all sample types. And then obviously implementing a US business footprint and the infrastructure to support that. And that's uh, our goals and, and in large part, I think, uh, reacting to the opportunity that we see in the emergence of home health and telehealth is a real driver of growth in the US. Um, with that, John and Will, I'll say thank you very much for your time. Enjoyed your presentation and uh, we look forward to keeping across your progress. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us.